Good morning. I thought I'd start with a little more of a light story and get vulnerable with you guys for a minute. Are you okay? Vulnerable and light, they don't go together, but they do in this one. So um, when I was a little kid, like 32 years ago, probably, um, oh, childhood. So don't judge my family, okay? Can we agree not to judge my family for this? Okay. And this is not parenting advice for you, parents. It's not parenting advice, but I want to tell you a story. When I was little, my parents would go to the gas station, and my brother and I would be sitting in the car, and they would get gas, and they'd go inside the gas station, and they would pay cash for their gas, like you know how you used to do. And sometimes they would, uh, I don't know if we would ask or if they were just like distract the kids for two minutes, but they would buy us those scratch-off lottery tickets. Um, And... You know, get in the car, hand them to us, give us pennies from the ashtray. We didn't smoke, but there were pennies in the ashtray, right? And then uh, we'd scratch them off. And one time, I mean, I think this probably happened more than once, I'd, I'd win, right? I would win a dollar or two dollars or three dollars. And one time we were driving away, and I said to my mom, or maybe it was both my parents, I was, they've told me this story, so I don't remember it, but I was like, I won, I won, I won. And they're like, no, you didn't, no, you didn't. And eventually, Once they stopped doubting me, they looked at the lottery ticket, and it was, I won $1,000 as a three-year-old, which um, means I didn't win. They won, and so my parents, um, they sent me and my brother packing to my grandparents' house, and they took a vacation to San Diego together. So um, I'm I'm not advocating gambling or buying lottery tickets. Please don't do that. Uh, you don't have to do that. I'm not advocating that. This story is about doubting. My parents doubted me, and they doubted that I knew what I was doing until they saw it for themselves. So that's what happened. T- today, we're continuing in our series, This is Jesus. We're examining the encounters Jesus had after the resurrection, like Stephanie said. And here in the last few weeks, we talked about the, uh, the fact that Jesus still loves us, the, the fact that he forgives us, and that he reveals himself to us. And today, we're going to keep talking about Jesus, which is exciting, because I love Jesus, and I like Jesus, and I like to talk about him. And so um, we're going to do that. We're going to look at a story that gets passed over pretty quickly, often, at least by me. I've never stopped and studied this story about the position that Thomas found himself in, and I'm probably not alone in that. And so more caveats. I've been involved in youth ministry for about 10 years at this church and at campus ministry before I was at Grace. And it largely feels like this game of like, get the students as much information about following Jesus as possible and build them support systems of adults who care about them and point them towards Jesus. And then when they head off to college or whatever after high school, you kind of stand back and you watch and you pray and you hope that like what we've taught them sticks. And what usually happens, at least in my experience, is that only one or two of, say, six high schoolers will still be following Jesus when they finish college. And it's, or whatever's next for them, and it's really, it's hard to watch. Um, In the past, many students would leave their faith, but then when they would come back to it later, they get married, they have kids, they go back to church, and that's not happening as much anymore. People aren't coming back. They're walking away, and they're not coming back. And There's lots of reasons I'm sure that exist about why, but I think one of the big ones that's on my heart is that that our students don't feel like they have permission to have unanswered questions and doubts in their life. Some of them grew up and some of us grew up and we didn't feel like church was a safe place for us to wrestle with our doubt, to wrestle with our questions. And I'm I'm in the same boat, it wasn't for me. But here's the thing, we want Grace Fishers to be a church that's for you, and for your family, and part of being for you and for your family is creating a space for you to process your doubts and your questions in a way that's healthy. And what I mean by healthy is that as you walk with Jesus and with your community as you process those things. So whether you've been following Jesus for a long time or you aren't sure about him today, like I just want to invite you in to look at this story in, with me and what we can learn about Jesus together. Sound good? All right. Thomas, one of Jesus' disciples, is a good example of someone who had firsthand experience with doubt and walking with Jesus. So we're going to look at the story of what we, some of us know as Doubting Thomas in John chapter 20. 
verses 24 through 29. It's page 902 in the Bibles, and it's in the app, and I'm sure you can find it on Bible Gateway. It's the book of John. It's good. And I um, just want to say good morning if you're online. Hi. If you're home in the rain, I, I understand. Um, see you next week, but i uh, glad that you're here watching online. So here's some of the things that happen in the book of John before we get to our passage. Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb, finds that the stone's been rolled away, and Jesus isn't there. Does anyone know what that holiday is? Easter? Yeah, okay. Cool. Jesus, I'm just seeing if we remember, like, that was a month ago maybe. So we're, Jesus appears to Mary and then Mary goes and tells Simon Peter and the other disciple about Jesus being alive. The other disciple was likely John. He calls himself the other disciple sometimes, and it's cool. Um, after Jesus is crucified, the disciples were afraid of the Jewish leaders, and so they were meeting in secret, and Jesus just shows up to them. Thomas wasn't with them, and then Jesus gives the disciples the Holy Spirit. So here's our passage. John 20, verse 24. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. And then Jesus told him, you believe because you've seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. So here's some thoughts that I had when I read this passage as I was preparing for today. I'm not going to answer all these questions, just stir our brains a little bit. Where was Thomas at the first time? Like if the disciples were meeting in secret, why was Thomas not with them? Maybe he was on a food run or um, a water run or who knows, but he wasn't there. Um, What happened in the eight days between the visits? What did they do? Jesus gives Thomas what he needs over and over and over again. And even when Thomas, wasn't, when, when Thomas wasn't there, and then he says to the other disciples, like, this is what I need to believe, Jesus knew. And so in verse 25, Thomas says what he needs. And then in verse 28, Jesus gives him exactly what he needs. I think verse 29 is for us. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Like this is for us because we don't get to see the physical Jesus. And so that's for us. Bless, we can believe without seeing. And then here's another thought I had. Why didn't Thomas trust the disciples' word, who he'd been walking with them for years? They were his friends. Why didn't he trust them? But here's what I think. Thomas needed convincing, just like I would, just like you would. And it's not the first time he needed it either. They'd been walking with Jesus for a while, right? And Thomas didn't understand who he was or where he was going. And then he meets Thomas. Jesus meets Thomas and embraces his doubts. And so here's another another story in the book of John, John 14, 1 through 7. We'll just be up on the screens. It says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I'll come and get you so that you'll always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I'm going. No, we don't know, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus told him, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. This doubting, questioning wasn't new for Thomas. He had a pattern of doubting. He did it twice, right? And he'd been walking with Jesus and didn't believe fully or know exactly who he was following. And when I was first scheduled to preach today and given this topic, I was like, oh man, this is tricky. And I thought and I wrote and I thought and I wrote. And then I asked this thing on my phone called Chat AI to write a message for me. And 
That's what I've been preaching so far. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> that's not true. But here's, here's some of the takeaways from my chat AI messages. Doubt is a natural part of the human experience. Doubt can lead to greater understanding. Faith is not incompatible with questioning. Belief is a choice. Faith is a journey. You could say amen and go home, right? It wrote me a 25-minute message on this story in two minutes. And those are the main points of the message. And so I just thought I would tell you that because it's kind of a random thing. And anyone can preach now. So um, <laughs> there you go. We have an opening in July. So if you can talk to Kevin, um, <laughs> if he survives Fuse today, you can talk to Kevin and then that would be good. So all right, back to our story and about Thomas. So without having all the details of where Thomas was during the first visit from with Jesus or like what he was doing or why he was struggling to believe his friends, there's still some things I think we can take away and learn about Thomas and about Jesus. And the first is our need to ask questions in the right way. Questions asked in the right way can set up our journey of doubt. And so I found this book, uh, my friend Josh Weber sent it to me. It's, it's called Help My Unbelief by Barnabas Piper, and it talks about doubting and asking questions. And so here, a, a quote from that book is, to ask well, we must ask with a willingness to receive an answer. Good asking is honest asking. Belief is built on this kind of asking because this kind of asking is built on trust. He continues on and says, asking well also means knowing when to lay our questions down. If we don't put away some questions, they will end up eating our beliefs from the inside out. When our life is easy, when it's trending up and to the right, like we all prefer, we ask questions because we're curious, because we want to grow, because we care, and yet we still want an answer. How many times have you been asked a question that you really didn't have a good answer for? I know for me, it's like, drives my wife crazy, I think. It's like, what do you want for dinner? I don't know. Uh, what do you want to do when you grow up? I don't know. The lack of an answer can frustrate the person that asked the question. And so I, I think similarly for us, when we're asking questions of God and they don't get answered in our timing or in our preference, it can frustrate us. And if asking well is based on belief and trust, then we need to be okay with not getting the answer right away or maybe not getting it at all. I believe that faith and doubt can go hand in hand. And what I see happening with our students and young adults is that they are asking hard questions. They're asking questions we don't have easy answers to or answers that they like. And some of them are letting that dismantle or deconstruct their faith. And as Piper said in his quote, it's eating their beliefs from the inside out. The word deconstruct or deconstruction has become kind of a hot topic in faith world in recent years. And here's what the definition we're going to use for today is. It's deconstruction is where people unpack, rethink, and examine their belief systems. Personally, I've gone through periods of deconstruction in my own life, and that has led to questions that I might never get an answer to, like more specific versions of why do bad things happen to good people or why would a good God let that happen? Or does God really think that way about such and such thing? And what seems to be happening to our students, though, is that they deconstruct in what I'll call the unhealthy way. They're not with people around them that have compassion and understanding and belief in Jesus and their best interest at heart. And they deconstruct because they have an unanswered question, and then they stop before they put it back together. That's the process of reconstruction. And reconstruction is so important to deconstructing in a healthy way. We used to take these trips back when um, I was in a young adult ministry at Grace, and we used to take these trips to a, a Toronto, Canada. And we would walk the streets of Toronto, and we would observe how different culture there is versus the Hamilton County bubble that most of us live in. And a big point of that trip was taking things that we'd always believed about faith and, and deconstructing that. And it, I mean, honestly, is one of my favorite trips I've been on. And yet what it did is it challenged my views. It, it challenged me to think maybe the world's not so black and white. And where it didn't really always help is it didn't always help us put it back together while we were there. And so in hindsight, now that I'm in a different place, I just, I wish that we 
would help our people, our, our young adults then especially, put their faith back together. Because with deconstruction and reconstruction as it relates to faith, like if you don't finish, if you only get 80% of the way back, it's going to leave you with an inc- incomplete picture of Jesus. You have to put it back together. Thomas, who we all know, who grew up in church, we all know him as Doubting Thomas, he seemed to have a doubt that was based on his belief. Like he gave up his vocation to follow Jesus. He spent several years learning from Jesus and following Jesus around and seeing the way that Jesus lived and the way that Jesus talked and the way that Jesus walked. It had to have been incredible. And yet he had doubts, and it was a good thing. Everybody has doubts. And so I want to break doubt into two categories for us, unbelieving doubt and believing doubt. Unbelieving doubt is a doubt that cripples Unbelieving doubt stops a person from moving forward. It says, I don't think I want that, or I don't believe that exists. And when unbelieving doubt poses a question, it's not interested in the answer for any reason other than to disprove it. Then there's believing doubt. The only reason that you wouldn't have doubts about things that you believed in is if you had a full understanding of the thing that you believe in. I'm going to read that again. The only reason you wouldn't have doubts about things you believed in is if you had a full understanding of the thing you believe in. So, for example, most of us in this room, I'm making an assumption, but most of us in this room believe in God, and the God we believe in created the universe and exists outside of time, and he knows our thoughts, and he knows the number of hairs on our head, which is easier for some of us than others, and It would be impossible for us to fully comprehend God. And so naturally, we're going to have doubts and we're going to have questions. But the difference between unbelieving and believing doubt is that believing doubt drives you back to belief. It drives you back to belief. It's the catalyst to find what we believe rather than the obstacle keeping us from it. Believing doubt will always anchor in God's character and word as as unshakable, and then take on questions that sometimes might be unanswerable. So if you stand fully in your relationship with God, even those unanswerable questions are not going to overcome your faith in your relationship with Jesus. And so it's fair to believe that Thomas had a believing doubt. And it's possible that the reason Thomas wasn't with the disciples is because he was doubting in an unhealthy way in that moment. Like his life just got turned upside down because he wasn't expecting it. And so what can we learn from Thomas? What does healthy, believing doubt look like in our lives? And I've got three ideas for us that I'm going to share. I'm sure there's like 50 ideas, but I've got three. So uh, the first is that faith communities are so important when life is good and when life is hard. And as I've been walking with the senior class, throughout their entire student careers here at Grace Fishers. It's been great to watch this happen in their groups, like to watch students take a doubt or an issue and take it to their leaders and say, hey, this is what I'm wrestling with and have their leaders be a safe place for them to hear their feelings, to process their questions, and then to, and then to point them back towards Jesus. It's invaluable. They listen to them. They point them to Jesus. We all need people like that in our lives And our kids and students, they need more people like that in their lives. Shameless plug, okay? Our children need a safe sounding board. They need a safe place with people who love them and people who won't judge them for their thoughts or their actions or their doubts. And so if that's you, uh, find Stephanie or I. We'll get you plugged in. Our students and our kids, they're hungry to have relationships with adults that care about them. And then there's you, the adults. If you aren't living life with a small community of people who believe in Jesus, you need to get one. You need to get one. Build relationships with them. Trust them so that they can help you when life is up and to the right and when it's down. We've got great small groups here. We've got great men's groups and women's groups here. Just get into community. Stop waiting. There's not a group connect next week or anything. Just get in community. You need it. So that's the first. Faith communities are important. The second idea is that Jesus embraces our doubts. When you doubt, you can lean into Jesus. Not if you doubt, but when you doubt. Lean into Jesus. He can handle your doubt. 
He embraces us in our fullness. He loves us no matter what we're wrestling with, no matter what we're going through, through the good, through the bad. And he moves us beyond our doubt, back to belief, back to relationship with him. Having a faith foundation in Jesus will help us doubt in a healthy way so that regardless of our answer to our doubt, regardless of the outcome, we will turn back to him. Even if questions are left unanswered, even, even if the thing didn't go the way we hoped it would, we can embrace our belief. We can embrace our doubt with Jesus and, and he's got our back. Of all the things that I've questioned in my life, where there have been a few, I keep coming back to Jesus. And it doesn't always make sense to me from jobs to losing loved ones to why are people without water and food in this world to some of the things we may feel like a good God wouldn't let happen, but he's a good God. And I won't understand fully why things happen and I won't get the answers to all my questions and neither will you. And yet, we can keep going back to Jesus. My doubts They do not erode my faith, they enrich my faith. And I know that's true for many of us. Jesus embraces our doubts. And the third thing we can do is we can be more like Jesus. We can learn to embrace doubts like Jesus does. As a church, we are about making disciples of Jesus and launching them into the mission of God. And a part of that mission is is being a safe place for those that are struggling, those that are having a hard time, those are doubting, exploring, whatever you want to say, Jesus. We need to be a safe place for them. I can be quick to judge, but Jesus is curious. I can be quick to judge, but Jesus is quick to love. And I can be quick to judge, but Jesus is quick to forgive. So when that person in your life comes to you and they're wrestling with a doubt or a question, we can put down our swords of judgment and our faces of disappointment, and we can love them. And oh my goodness, is that easier said from right here than done in our life, and I know that. If we, as a church, if we can do these things together, I think we're going to be better for it. I think our lives will be better because we won't doubt by ourselves. I think our lives will be better because we'll pursue Jesus more as we lean into his arms when we doubt. And I think our lives will be better as we become more like him in loving other people. Jesus wants to be the foundation of our lives and influencing everything that we do. For me, a huge connection point in my life, in my faith right now, is worship music. And I love it. I listen to worship music more than my wife, who's a worship leader. And I probably sing at home more than she sings at home, too. Maybe it's welcome, maybe it's not. But I have been listening, I listen to Spotify, and sometimes Spotify pops up and says, check this album out, and I've been um, just doing what it says. Maybe it's a little, like, bodish, but I've just been doing what it says. And so the other day, uh, a couple weeks ago, I was getting ready for this, and and a a hymn album came up, old, old worship songs, and it made me think about, like, the simplicity of the old songs and what they the words that they that they said and so this song came up and it's been with me ever since and here's the song it's turn your eyes upon jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace that's what we're called to do focus on jesus and Look full in his face, and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And if we focus on that, I think this other stuff will come out of that and fall in line. And I think we can, we can do that together. So as a church, we want to be a people that love each other well, lead each other closer to Jesus. And I'm excited to get to do this together, to embrace the doubts of each other. Um, in, a, in a healthy way. So let me pray, and then we're going to continue in our service. Jesus, thank you that you care about our lives, that you care about what we think about, that you care about our questions and our doubts. And I just pray that we as a church, that we 
could be a welcoming place for people to wrestle with their doubts, that we could be more like you. We love you. We thank you. And I'm just grateful to get to do church together and to worship you and to learn about you together. So just uh, be with us as we go today in your name. Amen.